Thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion on surveillance safeguards and strategy, campaigns for surveillance reform in North America, Latin America, and Africa. I'm Lauren Sarkeesian, a senior policy counsel at New America's Open Technology Institute, which is based in the US and works to ensure equitable access uh, to digital technology and all its benefits. Today, we're going to discuss the increasingly sophisticated tech tools available to governments worldwide and advocates reform efforts to, to, US surveil or to, to rein in mass government surveillance. In the United States, Congress recently considered reforms to US surveil surveillance laws via the USA Freedom Reauthorization Act. In Mexico, advocates have launched Gobierno Espia, a campaign to demand an end to impunity for the surveillance of journalists, human rights defenders, and activists. In Chile, civil society groups have been pushing back against police surveillance of social leaders, which has included surveillance of environmental organizations, workers' unions, political organizations, and human rights defenders. And in Nigeria, advocates continue to press for implementation of the Digital Rights and Freedom Bill, which would provide Nigerians protection from infringement of their fundamental freedoms on digital platforms. I'm excited to be joined by a great lineup of panelists from each of these countries who will discuss their recent efforts to rein in government surveillance, highlight lessons learned, and compare strategies for what works. If you have any questions, please add them into the chat and we'll work to address them towards the end of the session. Now I'd like to briefly introduce our panel. Sharon Bradford Franklin is the policy director at New America's Open Technology Institute. She also is the former executive director of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Luis Fernando Garcia Munoz is the executive director and co-founder of R3D, or Red in Defensa de los Derechos Digitales, a Mexican organization dedicated to defending human rights in the digital world. Next, Maria Paz Canales is executive director of uh, Derechos Digitales, a nonprofit organization based in Chile, but which works across Latin America on human rights in the digital environment. Finally, Bengas Desan is the executive director of Paradigm Initiative, a, pa a Pan-African social enterprise working on digital inclusion and, and digital rights in Ghana, Cameroon, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Zambia and beyond. Thanks everyone for joining us. First, we'd like to set the scene by hearing a little bit more background from each of our experts here on those surveillance reform efforts that were going on pre-pandemic. Sharon, first over to you. In, in the US, like I just mentioned, Congress recently considered reauthorizing provisions of the Patriot Act and civil liberties groups, including ours, OTI, worked to reform those authorities um, through the USA Freedom Reauthorization Act. Can you discuss a bit more about what those reforms looked like that advocates were seeking and why exactly they're needed? Sure, thank you. So when we first planned this session for RightsCon, I had actually expected to talk about how we had recently completed our campaign to seek reforms to the USA Patriot Act and to assess how well it had gone. Uh, I'm sure that audience members, even from outside the United States, have heard of the Patriot Act and the broad surveillance powers that it granted to the US government by expanding its powers under the US Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA. Three of these surveillance law provisions had been set to expire last December, and Congress passed a short-term extension until March 15th of this year. The normal course of things with each sunset date is that Congress doesn't want the provisions to expire, but as it considers a reauthorization of the expiring provisions, there's an opportunity for advocacy groups to engage in pressure for reforms to U.S. surveillance law. Amazingly, this year, Congress actually allowed the three provisions of surveillance law to expire this past March 15th, and still has not passed a law to reauthorize them or to enact further reforms to U.S. surveillance law. So as I can discuss further uh, later in the session, we are hopeful that we will now have a chance to explore even broader reforms to U.S. surveillance law. But to answer Lauren's question, um, through our campaign this year, uh, there are a wide variety of reforms that OTI and our allies uh, have been seeking, but I wanna just uh, outline a few of those, the key ones. Uh, first, 
As a bare minimum reform, Congress must end the Section 215 Call Detail Records or CDR program. This program replaced the bulk phone records program that Edward Snowden had revealed to the public in 2013. And that was the program through which the NSA swept up millions of records on which phone numbers were calling which other phone records, phone numbers, excuse me, and when. And although the currently authorized program uh, is much narrower than the bulk program it replaced, it is still privacy invasive. And the NSA actually shuttered it last year because it isn't even effective. So now Congress needs to permanently end this Section 215 CDR program as a first step toward reform. Second, Congress should strengthen and expand the role of the amici or friends of the court who participate in certain proceedings in our secret FISA court. Um, without the amici, those judges only hear from government attorneys. But these amici can contest the government's arguments and advise judges on privacy and civil liberties issues. Their role and authority needs to be expanded so they can provide much needed oversight for the FISA process. Third, Congress should clarify that US government may not rely on section 215 of FISA to collect any type of information that would require a search warrant in the context of criminal investigations. In particular, we need stronger safeguards for location information and for internet search and web browsing history. These sensitive and revealing types of information should require the government to meet a higher standard. We have also sought a variety of additional reforms, including establishing reasonable time limits on data collected under Section 215, uh, meaningful notice to criminal defendants, and additional transparency requirements. Thanks, Sharon. And so can you give us a little more, can you contextualize that a bit for us? So I know you said the legislation is sort of at a standstill, um, but where does that leave the broader surveillance reform efforts in the U.S.? Sure. So as I noted, surprisingly, Congress actually allowed the three sunsetting provisions of U.S. law to expire this past March 15th. Um, the House of Representatives passed their version of the USA Freedom Reauthorization Act back in March, just before the March 15th sunset date. Um, and it included some of the reforms that I outlined, but certainly not all of them. Then in May, um, two months uh, later, after the expiration of the provisions, the Senate passed its version of the same law, which was pretty much identical to the House version, but it included a key amendment that would further expand the role of the amici in the FISA court, as I described, the people who get in there to advise the judges. Um, and that is a key reform that we had sought. But the Senate bill still failed to include other key reforms, such as the safeguards for internet search and browsing history. But we had expected the two houses of Congress to go to conference and come up with a version of the bill that both houses would pass and then would be enacted into law. But that still hasn't happened, and we have no word on whether it, when or whether it will. Um, it's possible that um, these provisions of surveillance law won't be reauthorized at all, or at least not anytime soon. Uh, in the case of Section 215, uh, which allows the government to collect business records and also supports the call detail records program that I mentioned, um, it's important to note that, first of all, the government is still allowed to continue investigations that it had gotten authorized and begun before the law expired on March 15th. So many of those, we assume, are still ongoing. And second, that since March 15th, this business records provision simply reverted to its pre-Patriot Act or pre-2001 version. So there still is a legal authority in place for the government, even though it's narrower. Um, also, though, some people are concerned that since these statutory provisions went dark, the government is instead relying on an authority called Executive Order 12333, or EO 12333. That order actually governs most of what our intelligence agencies do, but it does not provide for as many safeguards for privacy and civil liberties as the statute FISA. Um, under a proper interpretation of that order, EO 12333, the government should not be able to simply replicate the statutory authorities that have gone dark. Um, but we have very little transparency and far less oversight for any surveillance conducted under that order. Uh, so, but it is really important to note that this is an unprecedented situation for the United States since the original passage of the Patriot Act back in October of 2001. Also, um, earlier this month, as many uh, audience members I'm sure are familiar, in the Schrems II decision, 
the Court of Justice of the European Union invalidated the privacy shield, finding that there are not adequate safeguards under US surveillance law to protect Europeans' data. So we have several forces now pressing the US government to undertake a more serious overhaul of US surveillance law. And I'm hoping that we'll have the opportunity to engage in that kind of more thorough reworking of our surveillance law in a comprehensive way. Thank you. Um, Luis, next we'll turn to you. So in Mexico, uh, as I mentioned, advocates launched the Gobierno Espia campaign in 2017 after numerous reports surfaced revealing that the Mexican government was targeting journalists, anti-corruption activists, and human rights defenders with advanced spyware um, known as Pegasus. Luis, specifically, what does the Gobierno campaign call for? Sure, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, well, as you mentioned, the, this campaign, Gobierno Espia, was launched after the revelation of several attacks, uh, surveillance attacks with this uh, malware called Pegasus, which is sold by um, the Israeli company NSO Group uh, in 2017, human rights defenders, journalists, etc. And although this was the main event that created this uh, momentum for for this call in society, in Mexican society, for for reform and for an end of, of impunity, this is a culmination of of years of research of advocacy that have shown how in Mexico there are great irregularities on uh, how uh, surveillance is acquired and how it is used. And when and, and, and beyond that, uh, that how difficult it is to first detect abuse, and second, once it is detected, how difficult it is for there not to be impunity about those abuses. And the, the, there's a direct link between those abuses, the impunity, the lack of, of clarity and transparency about the acquisition and use of these tools and regulation. So in, to, in a nutshell, I would say that the Gobierno Espia campaign obviously calls for uh, consequences for, for uh, an end of impunity of surveillance to the group of people that was detected, that were surveilled, but that we have always said that it, it is a, a tip of the iceberg uh, a situation in which we just know a few people who have been targeted because also something that is really important to take into account is that these tools are being designed in a way in which uh, they are made not to be detected. So uh, uh, it is similar to, for example, when the arms industry uh, has produced uh, weapons, firearms that do not leave a fingerprint, for example. You know? uh, and that has been very controversial, but somehow we haven't discussed much about if it's legitimate that, that governments, democratic or supposedly democratic governments, uh, uh, acquire and use tools who they can use with impunity without any type of accountability. Uh, and this is what, what has happened in, in, in Mexico. Uh, once we were able to uh, demonstrate that there were these malware attacks with Pegasus in Mexico, then uh, it was a, a matter of, of when then what now, no? And there's a lot of obstacles that the lack of regulation has produced, like uh, there's apparently, there's no registry of which tools the, the state has acquired. There's no registry of companies that sell this type of, of, of tools. There's no registry of people who are uh, uh, trained to operate these types of tools. And then the investigation becomes very difficult. Uh, which is why after three years of, of a lawsuit that we launched uh, denouncing these events, there's been no real progress uh, in this sense. However, there's been a change in government recently and the government has, new government has claimed that they will not use these tools. And uh, as part of, of some commitments that they've made, there's a working group in which civil society and authorities, we are, discussing in ways just in three in three aspects that are really important. One, uh, which rules need to be established with regard to the acquisition of surveillance tools? Also, which rules should be established to make the use of surveillance tools and powers uh, accountable uh, uh, in this sense? And third, 
uh, how uh, we, we how the, the the Mexican government is going to give uh, truth and clarity to the whole society about what happened in the past uh, and how to make sure that there's no impunity about the abuses that for years have happened uh, in Mexico. Perhaps um, uh, further along in the conversation, I can discuss about all the policy proposals that, that we have been pushing. Thank you, Luis. Um, and I was going to ask about sort of progress. It sounds like Sounds like you haven't had the the progress that you would like um, in terms of of you know seeing real regulatory reform. But um, at least in civil society, you are making these moves to um, uh, come together and and develop these rules. Um, yeah, right. th 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 there's a process ongoing that it's uh, um, uh, we'll get to see. Um, uh, we're yet to see if that. Uh, process is going to uh, produce any substantive results, but there is a discussion in, in which we're in, in a table with the government and, uh, and civil society, and we're discussing these things, which is a progress in the sense that two years ago that the government was spying on civil society. So um, we'll see if this is if this comes if from this something more material comes because it's needed. The truth is today the same rules that gave that produce this, uh, this situation in which there's uh, rampant abuse of surveillance without accountability and with total impunity, the same rules are still there. There's been no reform. Uh, there's been just a promise and political will shown, but we need to make that concrete and material uh, materialize in, in reforms. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Luis. So next over to Maria. Um, so in Chile, civil society groups have been pushing back against uh, uh, police surveillance and social media monitoring of, of leaders, um, which has included surveillance of, like I said, environmental organization leaders, workers unions, political organizations, uh, human rights defenders. So can you provide a bit more background on the conversation that's happening there in Chile? Um, how and when the surveillance came to light and what advocates are doing to push back. Sure, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, and uh, to have the opportunity to share with these wonderful colleagues uh, with experience from different places of the world. So I will talk a little bit of the Chilean case in particular, uh, but as uh, you mentioned in, in, in my presentation, we work in, in Latin America. So I think that I would like to connect a little bit with the reality that we are seeing here in Chile with with things that are happening across Latin America in general. And in, in, in many cases, uh, even they are more severe in other Latin American countries than in Chile. So the context for all this, just for the people that is joining us in this session and, and doesn't have a, a clear um, a, a panorama about what is going on in, in these uh, uh, terms in Latin America, uh, just before the pandemic, the last months of uh, 2019, we have uh, several different uh, situations of social uprising in different Latin American countries. We had uh, social protests in Ecuador, in Colombia, in Bolivia, in Chile. Majority of them linked with uh, the claiming of the people for changing some uh, economic and social structure that had been in place for a for long time in the region. And they were questioning uh, how the government should engage and provide a, a fair opportunity to everybody to benefit of the wealth that had been created in the, in the recent years. Others are uh, also linked to co a political situation. And uh, in the case of uh, Colombia, also armed conflict play a big role. All those issues that are very complex uh, social and economic issues were in place. So in this context, people uh, was exercising in general their right to, to peacefully assess assembly and peacefully protest. But of course, in all this situation, there, there are some uh, uh, facts that go out of control and, and there is some uh, uh, incidents of violence, either from the protesters, but also in the reaction from, from the police force. So in this context, uh, there was all uh, a narrative coming from the police force and not only from the, from the law enforcement in general, but also from the government, from the central government, 
to try to use uh, and leverage uh, all the uh, the surveillance capacities that have been developed in the recent years from the intelligence service side and also from the from the law enforcement side. So all these cap capabilities have been developed in the recent years in, in the region and in particularly in Chile without having a clear uh, legal framework. There is in Chile particularly a, a, a intelligence and service law that broadly regulate the, um, the, the activities and civilian activities that are uh, commanded to different bodies of the, of the, of the government, among them, uh, one role is played directly by law enforcement, which is uncommon because usually in other countries those functions are separated. But the thing is that the provisions are quite old at this moment, um, 10 uh, years old or more, and they don't capture well the use of technology, particularly for these kind of uh, activities of, uh, of uh, intelligence activities and surveillance in case in which could be authorized inside the provisions of the law. So what we have is that the, the government have increased their capability of acquisition of these technologies, the same that uh, uh, Luis was describing for Mexico. They acquired these technologies and there's no transparency about how they conduct this process of uh, acquisition of the technologies, what are the actual capabilities of the technologies, who inside the different agencies that are acquiring these technologies will be in charge of managing them. All that kind of things are uncertain. So at the end, what we have is that the capability is being developed in the acquisition of the technology, but the legal framework is not updated for dealing with that situation. And we have a situation of social protests and social manifestation on the street that uh, create in some way a scenario in which the authority is tempted to use all this for precisely try to control these social movements and go beyond, uh, in our opinion, of what is authorized in, in this law framework, but because they are outdated and they are very general in their provision, they provide this space of interpretation that we think that is unfair and, and we would like much challenge. But in many cases, the, the way in which is, this is being developed is very opaque, which makes it really difficult to go against this in, these uh, measures and challenge them judicially. The same thing that the, the, the Mexican case uh, pointed out, it's, it's the difficulty of catching when this is happening, because you need a, a technical capability from civil society or from, from the, the very uh, affected by these surveillance activities that usually lacks to identify that you have been subject to this kind of uh, surveillance measure and, and being able to have legal resources and support for challenging this situation and to keep the evidence for actually uh, being able to be successful in those challenges. So all that is very critical. And, and, I, and, and maybe a last point that I want to wrap up on this is that when we're talking about this in general, we are um, focusing a little bit more in the surveillance technologies that are related with communication surveillance. So the cases of Mexico, for example, it's the use of spyware. You were also uh, talking about the provision uh, in, the, in, in the Patriot Act in, in, in the US that are linked to how to have access to the information uh, regarding the communication. But also, as I mentioned in, in, in the introduction, many of these technologies are being deployed in the recent years in Latin America, uh, more linked to the surveillance of the public space and the surveillance of the body, as we try to capture it in, in a concept, because uh, those also imply the use, for example, of camera, facial recognition cameras that are deployed in the public spaces, or even high definition cameras that are being deployed in the public spaces, and, the, and they are uh, interconnected in, in central services that allow uh, the authority to, to have a panopticon, that when you are thinking that this all this has been put in place under the narrative of public safety, people can think that, it could be acceptable, but when you realize that the same uh, technology is being used in the situation of, of protest 
for pursuing and, and, uh, and uh, restrain the action of social movements and, and try to further marginalize people that is already in the street because they, they feel that government don't hurt them and, and, uh, and they need to transmit their message. These technologies become a, a, a tool of surveillance, not a tool of protection of the safety of the people, but exactly the other way around. So it's also a, a thing to have uh, in mind. And, and the last piece of the categorization of technologies that are being used in this sense that also was mentioned in the introduction, so I don't want to leave it up in the air, is the, the, the um, increasing uh, trend that we are seeing in Latin America in general about the use of the uh, open uh, source intelligence. Uh, and uh, This referred to the concept of using information that is up there uh, in the public platforms, in social network, regarding the activities, because a lot of this social organizing and social movement take place now in the digital network. So the intelligence services and the law enforcement are going into uh, Facebook or other open uh, networks to try to catch the activity of these different groups and using that information in order to uh, take action in, in many cases, illegitimately repress or, or subject them to surveillance when they are not uh, guilty of any crime. They are exercising their their. Uh, constitutional rights of organizing. And, and we think that this is very, also very problematic because many of these activities, again, are taking place without clear guidelines. There are not rules that allow us to understand that this is going on, what are the limits in which purpose uh, can be used, and how to claim when, when some of, of these actions are trespassing the, the limit and really creating a, a limitation and a violation of the human rights of the subject. So I will stop there, but I think that, that those are uh, important elements for, for the, the trend that we are seeing in Latin America in general. Thank you. And I, I like that that framing, open source intelligence. That's, that's certainly um, a thing that we're seeing here in the United States as well. Um, so thank you. Uh, next, we'll, we'll move to Venga. And so in Nigeria, um, Advocates continue to press for implementation of the Digital Rights and Freedom Bill, um, which was enacted by the two chambers of Nigeria's National Assembly and sent to the president back in early 2019, um, but still has not been signed into law. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the bill itself, You know what's in it, what would it change, and why hasn't it been implemented? Thank you, Lauren. Um, and just before I talk about the bill itself, uh, I just want you know set this within the context uh, of what's happening within the region generally. Um, and, and saying that 2013, seven years ago, was a very important year uh, as far as surveillance in Africa you know are concerned. Uh, and I say that because that incidentally was was the same year where you know research outputs by uh, digital rights actors and academia uh, and, you know, people in academia sort of revealed, you know, all of this uh, use of surveillance tools by many African governments. Of course, they've always been there, always known about this. Uh, but I think the most uh, interesting was one that became the report of, I mean, Finn Fisher was, of course, you know, one of the things found with Nigeria and a few other countries. Uh, but that year was when we found out two key things. One was that all along, all of the surveillance tools being bought by governments were included in the public budget. Uh, and and it, was, it was kind of interesting because it was an easy way to find out what was going on uh, because this budget line items had exact names of the products that were being bought. So for example, in 2013, uh, you had this product that was being sold by, you know, Israel-based Elbit Systems that was listed exactly in the annual budget. Uh, of course, it was it was inflated in the budget, uh, which also brings the issue of surveillance and corruption uh, to the fore. Uh, but but that was the one year where a lot of coverage happened on that, and that was very helpful. It was helpful because all along, when we had met with you know various government institutions, it had always been denial, like. No one is doing this. Yes, we have a military past, but since 2000, since 1999, you know, we've been good boys and girls and things like that. But of course, everyone knew it wasn't true. Uh, so it was it was really useful to do that. And then we went to court. Uh, we went to court because we thought now we have this information in public and it would be interesting to ask the government. Now you've started doing this and you've admitted to doing this. 
but what are the principles behind this? What sort of regulation is this following? Uh, what what standards? Uh, and of course, we knew that you know there wasn't. Uh, the rule was being made up as things were going. Uh, so the objective was surveillance. And so when there was the trouble of terrorism, then terrorism became an excuse to implement surveillance programs. Then when there is the issue of any kind of unrest, then that unrest then becomes an excuse to also you know, continue with the agenda. So the constant factor uh, was surveillance all through this period. All we did, uh, you know, when going to court was to challenge this and say, there must be rules in place before you can do these things. Uh, it would interest you what the judge uh, in charge of that case said. Uh, the judge called us busybodies and, and asked, uh, why we were interested in what was being used to hunt terrorists. Uh, I, you know, this is this is this obviously uh, paints the picture of the sort of work that needed to be done. So as civil society, we then decided we were not going to keep saying we don't want this, we don't want that, we don't want mass surveillance, we don't want that. Uh, we then decided. Uh, what exactly do we want? Uh, you know, it started with a short uh, thing that I wrote. It was called the Internet. De- Freedom Declaration for Nigeria. And then we uh, had a forum with a few other colleagues of ours and drafted what then became the first draft of a digital rights and freedom bill. Uh, Of course, as private citizens, we can't take this to parliament ourselves. So we found an ally uh, who eventually uh, sponsored this bill. Uh, And and basic components of the bill were things that we thought uh, would answer the question questions of what exactly do we want. Uh, One was a focus on right to digital privacy. Uh, The other was of course anonymity, uh, which became a very controversial topic because the question was, if you're not, I mean, if you're not doing something wrong, why do you want to be anonymous and things like that? And, you know, it's it's interesting that we also focused a lot on surveillance, uh, I mean, for obvious reasons, because this was something that was already being done and there was no rule around it. Uh, we also focused on data protection and on freedom of expression. Um, and in, you know, all through the period, so in 2014, this whole process started, we eventually got a sponsor in 2016. We invited the legislator to our forum and he did promise at the forum in, you know, September 2016 that he would sponsor the bill. Uh, in August 2016, it will sponsor the bill, and before the end of the year, it will go through, you know, a few processes and things like that. Uh, good news is I did sponsor the bill. It's not every time that a politician says something in public uh, that he fulfills the promise. So, you know, we're kind of grateful that he did that. Uh, Honorable Tukwe Meka Ujam, uh, he did that. By the end of December, the bill had gone through second reading. Uh, that's by the end of 2016, and then everything went quiet until 2018 when the bill got passed eventually, and then a whole year of harmonization before it got passed by the uh, the second uh, chamber of parliament. Uh, and then it got to the president's table and the president did not sign the bill. The reasons he gave are quite interesting. Uh, you know, one of the reasons he gave was that the bill focuses on too many technical subjects, uh, which, which, you know, which is quite interesting is a way to say. Uh, the other was that the bill addresses uh, data protection, which is the subject of legis- another piece of legislation. Uh, don't forget the fact that uh, at that time, there was nothing. Uh, the only thing that Nigeria had for data protection was a bill. It was a bill that was also being considered. So we knew that that wasn't the real reason. Uh, and of course, the, the good news, by the way, is that it wasn't just civil society that saw the need for this bill. And I think this is really important in terms of uh, legislative advocacy, that it it shouldn't be one of those silos uh, talking to yourselves, and then eventually you realize that, you know, this is is not, you know, what uh, other people want. Uh, So this was declined in 2019, and the first thing we did was to call a meeting. We knew who said no, right? I mean, it was very easy for us to tell uh, because from the language of the president, we could tell which agency of government was sort of behind that. I mean, come on, you know, we, we were born into this country and we've been here for at least, uh, you know, almost 40 years. So we kind of know who said what. Uh, we invited them into the room and asked them questions about what exactly they thought. Uh, and we made them realize that, you know what, as individuals, it is in your own interest for you to have a fair playing field. And what also helped, also helped us was the fact that in 2015, there was a change of government. So all of the surveillance tools that was invested in by the previous government uh, and was used against the then opposition, 
uh, is now in the hands of the then opposition, which is now the government. Of course, which is now being used against the new opposition, which was the then government. And so we basically said to them, if you do not want to be a victim of your own investments, we think it's a good idea for you to invest in a level playing field, at least for you to have a right uh, to fair hearing. And it was very easy to say that because the man who was national security advisor at the time when we started our campaign uh, who said to us at some points that oh are you guys friends with terrorists eventually fell out when his you know political party lost elections uh and you know till today he's still trying to demand for his own rights in fact at some point we cracked a joke uh when he released a statement and we said you know what this statement looks like something we will say uh, so we should sue him for plagiarism for using our words about rights and freedom and things like that uh, but you know, while while the consultation continued, we also realized that it was important for us. So right now, instead of having one bill that addresses digital rights and freedoms and also addresses data protection, we've taken out uh, the elements of data protection, and we're now working with other partners to make sure that that in itself sees the light of day. Um, you know. And that we think is important. You do not want to dilute the bill, but at the same time, you don't want to have political bottlenecks uh, in terms of having it signed by the president. And, and the, the good news is that while all of this is going on, there are also conversations with many other countries where these processes have now started. Uh, so in Cameroon, in Malawi, in Togo, in Zambia, and a few other countries. Uh, in fact, we just you know had one of... Uh, the East African countries, a member of parliament reached out recently to get a copy uh, of this bill. And we're not... We're not only waiting for this to happen, because now that the president signed in 2019, that session of the National Assembly is gone. Uh, there's now the ninth uh, National Assembly. The process has started again. Uh, I think we were very fortunate that the person who chose to sponsor the bill at uh, this time is a very senior person. Uh, you know, we met with him and realized he had picked the bill before we even advocated for it. Uh, and I think the word digital was very useful in making that happen. Uh, and the reasons he chose the bill were quite interesting, but it's it's not, uh, you know, covered by today's curriculum. So I'll leave that out. Uh, and, and so we, we, we've ha we've seen some progress, major progress uh, on the bill in the ninth assembly. Uh, we're talking to various, you know, uh, stakeholders. We're talking to even people who uh, are close to the presidency to make sure that this time it doesn't get to him, uh, you know, with any enemies waiting to say, don't sign and don't sign and don't sign. And at the same time, we're also making sure that one of the biggest tools that is used, not just for surveillance, but majorly for oppression or, you know, opposition of journalists and all that, we also challenged uh, the cybercrime law of Nigeria uh, that was signed in 2015. We've challenged that. Of course, as usual, we lost uh, the case at the beginning, but then we appealed, and now we have appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, and we're just waiting for a day from the uh, from the Chief Law Officer so that we can then uh, go to the court. But that is, you know, that has also been helped by the fact that the ECOWAS Court actually uh, listened to the same case and has now asked the government of Nigeria to remove sections twenty four. Uh, and the other section uh, 38 from that cybercrime law because it does not, it isn't in line with the, with the constitution of Nigeria. So we have all this, I mean, these two different processes going on at the same time. Uh, one is don't want, uh, which is basically what is wrong with current legislative and uh, legislative provisions and things like that. And what we do want, which is a digital rights and, and freedom bill. And, and I'll stop here so we can you know continue with the conversation. I'm happy to answer specific questions about the bill itself and also what's happening in other countries within the region. Thanks, Laurie. Thank you, Venga. Thank you for all the helpful background. Um, so it, it sounds like I'm, I'm hearing similar themes from everybody of sort of uphill battles and um, a struggle to create sort of permanent lasting, um, you know, rules for acquisition, uh, laws, et cetera. Um, uh, of these technologies. So I'd like to try to draw from, from lessons uh, across you know, regions here and discuss strategies for success a little bit in scaling back surveillance. Um, what do you guys think, what has been most successful, whether it's you know, litigation or if it's grassroots efforts, um, uh, you know, whether it's just elections and the changes in administrations? Um, what have you found that's worked best for your organizations or civil society generally? Maria, it sounds, looks like you're ready. Oh, sure. Yeah, I can go. Um, 
I think that the, the answer, of, uh, as usual, is a combination of all of them. Um, I think that the one um, element that maybe I, it would work that I highlight because my, my colleagues can focus in the other ones also, uh, it's the, um, the um, usefulness that uh, the international human rights framework has also as an element of advocacy, particularly from the perspective of Latin America. Uh, as has been very difficult to drive attention and local attention on these issues because they are complex in terms of the technical aspect and because uh, these are issues that are very sensitive. So many, many persons can have a personal opinion on this, but a lot of people also is afraid to publicly appear like advocating uh, for some of these things and being framed in the way in which given uh, was describing for for Africa also like that you want to protect criminals you want to protect terrorists that kind of narrative is very common and and also in in different contexts in Latin America we have a situation of a uh, of lack of respect of human rights and and, and pr uh, persecution of a human rights defender that put them uh, at at risk of life so at the end it's not easy sometimes advocating against this uh, uh, complex uh, situation and precisely as i was pointing out previously because there are not much evidence also for have strong legal cases that can be followed uh, at the national level so many times the role of the international human rights uh, bodies on this is very relevant in terms of highlight attention on these issues and the role of civil society providing evidence to these international human rights bodies, for example, the special rapporteurs or the different mechanisms inside the different uh, body treaties. Uh, are very relevant in terms of like uh, building uh, a set of evidence of what is going on in, in terms of the use of all these uh, surveillance mechanisms and how they are actually impacted in, in a very concrete way in, lim in limiting the exercise of different human rights, uh, particularly civil and political rights, so freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, um, but also freedom of movement in, in, in many cases, but also in, in general also they are uh, uh, taken as way in which uh, the um, the control can be exercised on the society and and keep things on change when they are a, a political opposition that want to move things in different direction. So I think that uh, it's very relevant to uh, understand these as as elements that can be leveraged for uh, using in the national strategy, uh, and those are building blocks. Of course, that uh, the more concrete impact you will have if you are able to successfully advocate for changing laws at the local level, at the national level, or federal level for the federal states. Um, but uh, these piece of international pressure are very relevant to really point attention uh, from the uh, political powers and from the community at large in this situation and how severe they are. So the, the work in, of the Special Rapporteur in Freedom of Expression at the UN uh, level and, and the work of the uh, Special Rapporteur in, in Peaceful Assembly have been very key in, in this uh, sense. And also the Special Rapporteur in Freedom of Expression from the Inter-American System that also have paid a lot of attention uh, to these issues lately. And, and, and all these mechanisms can contribute to enrich this discussion. Sharon, go yeah, ahead. I mean, I, oh, okay, uh, maybe after. Either way. All right, you're muted. I'm not. All right, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so um, I, I just wanted to add add on to this. In in the United States, uh, I, I would agree that all of the strategies can be helpful. Although, as various of our allies have pursued litigation strategies. These can be particularly challenging um, when you're looking at surveillance because of a couple of judicial doctrines. Um, it can be often often be difficult, if not impossible, for any kind of plaintiff to prove that they were actually subject to surveillance and so to have their day in court. And also because uh, often our government is successful in asserting the state secrets privilege, saying that in order to defend itself, it would have to reveal classified information in court. And so a lot of these cases get kicked out without ever being heard. Um, but I did want to point to two strategies for advocacy that are somewhat similar to what Maria was talking about in terms of tactics and getting other bodies to show the real need for reform or, or having those, those kind of tactical strategies. And in the U.S., um, sadly, um, many members of our Congress are um, 
less looking to international bodies like uh, special rapporteurs, but we have been able to have some success when we can get inspector general investigations. And those reports can be very convincing in, to members of Congress and showing abuses. And in past reauthorizations of the Patriot Act, we have often been able to get, I would say often, sometimes been able to get um, directions for specific inspector general reports. And even in the absence of any kind of malicious actors, our surveillance system is so large and so complex that there always seem to be violations of the rules. And when those can be documented by an inspector general investigation, it really can help build the case for reform. And in fact, in the past year, we've had uh, two public uh, reports by the Department of Justice inspector general on FBI and, and Department of Justice implementation of FISA that have shown some very serious problems and have been helpful in building bipartisan support for reform, even though no one's enacted anything yet. Um, the second one I wanted to point to is um, that in general, it's been helpful in the U.S. to keep having uh, sunset dates for the surveillance law provisions. So when um, you know provisions are set to expire at a date certain, this requires Congress to reconsider them and has often been a juncture to get um, reforms enacted. Um, and in this case, it actually led to an actual sunset. Yeah, so I wanted to quickly uh, jump in on, on litigation and, and admit, of course, it is difficult uh, and the outcomes can never be predictable. Uh, but the good news is that it, it also it has a way of demonstrating seriousness uh, on the part of, uh, you know, advocates. And apart from that, I think it provides a lot of you know, material for not just precedents in courts, uh, but also information for research. Um, it also, in terms of citizen awareness, I, I think that, you know, the narratives, and, and like I said earlier, many times this is framed as a security versus uh, freedom conversation. And I think that we, we, need, we need to change, we need to frame this conversation uh, so that uh, it is very clear that security and rights, it's not a dichotomy. It's the fact that one supports the other. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I realized that many times people then say, oh, it's either you choose security or you choose freedom. It's because they're hiding uh, behind that emotive, you know, uh, dichotomy and it doesn't help uh, with framing the conversation. And, uh, and, and the last thing is to say, you know, what has worked, what has helped you know, uh, us so far is document, document, document. Uh, once COVID set in and the restrictions started in March, uh, the courts were not working, but one thing we made sure to do, and that will then be published in our report at the end here, uh, alongside the work in terms of, you know, advocacy and things like that, is to document everything, to make sure that we have records of all violations so that when we then make our case, it is not an emotional, you know, sentimental case. It is a fact-based case that we're then pushing. Thanks, Benga. How about you, Luis? Yeah, uh, also I want to mention, of course, I, I think we cannot afford a civil society to choose one and proceed from other strategies. We have to do everything uh, and choose where it makes more sense. For example, in Mexico, we do have a better environment for litigation. We don't have to prove standing. We don't have... Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of advantages for doing litigation in Mexico, but also, of course, challenges. No? We already have an, a case in the American system, which, as we as more as, as, we, uh, as as we know, is the most advanced in the system. Although it's very uh, lengthy procedure in the Inter American Commission, but eventually it can become a, a very important case that sets a precedent for the whole region. Some extra strategies that I want to mention is. Uh, statistics and access to information laws we have used very intensively to produce evidence about irregularities in the use of surveillance tools. Uh, joining and working with journalists uh, who can uncover and, 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 and produce uh, documents that come from whistleblowers have been essential. And the documentation of cases, because for a lot of people, this still seems like science fiction or something that they cannot touch and see. And once you put a face on the victims of surveillance, it, it becomes easier and the narratives change. And we've seen that in Mexico, in which surveillance has been sold as this magical tool against organized crime. And once we, we, we dem demonstrated all these cases, the public shifted and, and now uh, we don't generally ex accept uh, this. And the other thing is that we need to get into the specifics of reform, not just fluffy 
to inspire now stuff, but more concrete uh, policy proposals. And that's why uh, we, out of the challenges that we have for impunity or for abuse, that's why we're calling for very specific things. Like uh, if you want to sell this type of, of, of tools, like Venga said, said this is a, a business ripe of corruption. Uh, for corruption. Uh, uh, for example, Pegasus in Mexico was sold by a company that is a shell company that uh, have never sold anything to anyone before this and has never sold anything after that. It was just a company that was just made up to make this 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 uh, contract, which is obviously protected by secrecy laws, etc., which you can break if you fight for it, but you have to fight for it. So I think definitely... Uh, 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 Attacking also the business side of this, which is a, bis a corrupt business between companies and governments, uh, is also very important. And for that, we need uh, rules that make that more difficult. And, and we've been calling for registries uh, of, of companies that have to obtain authorization to sell these types of tools, which limits on which tools can a, can a government acquire, which registrations and which paper trail needs to exist. Uh, First, to be able to detect abuses, and second, once they're detected, so you have documents and paper trail that you can investigate on to try to attribute those cases to, to, to someone. No, so I think definitely also delving more on the specifics and the and the, and and what we as civil society are calling for. What does does regulation, accountability, transparency actually means in practice? It's totally essential, and for that collaboration in all of these strategies between organizations is key. Thank you. Okay, so you all laid out a lot of different efforts that you're working on. And of course, amid all of the, these efforts to scale back surveillance, the pandemic hit, right? And um, as a result, we've seen, you know, governments, um, you know, increasing public health surveillance and considering tools um, that, you know, in some cases are uh, for digital contact tracing or exposure notification. Um, in some cases, quarantine enforcement, um, collection of cell phone and location information, and beyond. Um, so I want to talk about how this added layer of the pandemic and this increased surveillance um, really impacts the overall narrative and the overall efforts that you all have been working on. Um, who would like to go first? Maria. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, we could have an entire panel and we have had panels on this in RightsCon already. So uh, only to quickly summarize, I think that the most relevant uh, connection of this uh, new pandemic uh, uh, technology optimism <laughs> that has been deployed, it's precisely the, um, the, the risk of, of shifting again the narrative. The same, uh, a lot of people is using the comparison that I think that is very useful uh, between what happened in the 9-11 uh, in the United States and the implementation of measure that's supposed to be only for the emergency situation and then they will go away. And here we are uh, with this measure being uh, still in place uh, after so many years and after they never have been proven that they are really uh, effective efficient and, 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 and appropriate for tackling the, the problem that they're supposed to tackle in the first place. So it's very similar with the uh, use of technology in pandemic situation that it's presented and, and packaged in this moment as technology that, that will help uh, to save life, to protect everybody and uh, ensure that everybody can exercise their right of health. And people uh, is uh, is being told that they should worry a, a lot about privacy or other consideration because governments care about them. And, and in this moment, it's more important to save life and we can handle the other issues later. But the, but the reality is, is not uh, the way in which these things are work, working. Uh, these things have this ability, incredible ability, and governments have this incredible temptation to once they have in place the system and they are able to gather the data, then they find creative ways to reuse that data. And, and 
something that started with one purpose at the end is very difficult to uh, track that is keeping in that purpose because uh, we don't have the oversight mechanism, the rules that you have been talking about for really be sure that this uh, don't end in the function creep that is the way in which uh, the phenomena is being described. So I think that that's the most important piece. Like this is a very huge uh, thread in terms of narrative. Uh, and at the end, convince the people that for uh, being safe, they need to give up rights. It's a wrong framework in, in any situation and even more in emergency situation in which later we will need a world in, in which we can fully exercise all our, our uh, rights in order to better recover and, and be able to uh, more equally participate in the social life. So I, I'd like to agree 100% with everything Maria said. She even gave my Patriot Act example, so um, which is great. No, 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 I didn't. That's good. That's good. So I can be, I can be faster um, and give everybody else a chance to talk. So just two things. Uh, one, on the very specific issue of the contact tracing and digital tools, um, uh, Lauren and I and a team of colleagues from OTI have actually been doing a lot of work on this, and we actually issued a report at the beginning of this month outlining the equity, privacy, and civil liberties risks posed by digital tools um, that can be used to supplement contact tracing and looking at as well at safeguards that policymakers can adopt to mitigate those concerns. So that's important, uh, really critical to have guardrails in place, including making sure that you're using the Bluetooth apps that measure how close people come to each other instead of location information and addressing the fact that so many people don't even have smartphones and the equity issues there. Um, on the broader point that Maria made, uh, I agree absolutely and completely and we're very concerned about that. I am hopeful, though, that unlike the case with terrorism, where policymakers can never safely say, OK, that risk is over, we can rein in surveillance, that one day in the not too distant future, we can say that this pandemic is actually ending and that justification will go away. And so it's really critical we put those guardrails in place and have sunset dates for any kind of surveillance measures that are adopted. Thank and I think you know one, one, one trend that we've seen now very quickly uh, uh, is that we've seen the appropriation of health surveillance uh, for uh, you know, political and anti-popular opinion surveillance, you know, and, and that, that's very worrying because one of the things that we hope does not happen is that some of the things that are being done now during this pandemic do not become the new normal and an excuse for governments uh, with an agenda to implement uh, what they already had in mind. So I think if there's any time we need to pay attention, it is now. If there's any time we need to speak up about the issues, document things and make sure that nothing escapes us it is now because this is the moment that you know uh anyone with an agenda would take advantage of very clearly as we've seen done across from the north to the south thanks go ahead Luis. And very quickly and also building on the point that, that all of you have made uh, i think some that are seizing this opportunity also. And I think this is something that will be difficult to, one of the things that I think will be more permanently with us, even when we find the vaccine and there's no pandemic anymore, uh, is that there's this, a lot of push uh, behind these digital ID um, uh, uh, initiatives because everything is digitized now and to access services. And, and in, for example, in Mexico, there's a lot of discussion and, 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 and now urgency apparently on uh, rushing a centralized uh, biometric database uh, and digital ID system uh, that can provide this even more granular surveillance on all citizens and, and, and constitutes a massive surveillance system in, in a sense. Uh, so definitely uh, uh, that's something to, be, to point out and to also look for uh, uh, around the world because I think this this is one of the agendas that Goenga was, was saying that I think it's it's definitely trying to use this opportunity to push it even further all over the world. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I think we might need to wrap it up there since we're about at time. But thank you to our amazing panelists who gave such insightful um, 
thoughts. And thank you to RightsCon for hosting us. And thank you to everybody in the audience who tuned in. Um, appreciate the, the opportunity to chat. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.